So speaking of religion, Salam and I never really discussed religion, but one day in the early 70s in Trieste, where there was, he was more free to discuss things, he mentioned that he had a conversation with Bertrand Russell a few years earlier. Some of you may know Bertrand Russell was a committed athe atheist, and uh, Salam said he was very old. He died in his upper 90s, and he must have been around 92 or 3 when Salam discussed things with Bertrand Russell. And uh, apparently, Russell, he asked Russell whether, what he thought of religion and God and so on. And Russell told him very firmly, in fact, that he didn't, he didn't want to change his views at all. So that was his discussion. Uh, we know, we'd never really talked about religion that much. As a student, as, an under, as a graduate student, Salam once came to my office, uh, you know, we shared offices, of course, and said, oh, um, he needs some help with his car, which is parked at the physics department outside. So I thought as a precaution, I'll take my friend, Amin Patani, who was a graduate student there at the time. And so the two of us went down, and Salam, as you know, is a theoretical physicist, had no idea what to do, because the rear tire had, had a puncture. You know, it must have hit a nail and there was puncture. So, I mean, and I looked at it and we had never done anything with a car. We were also theorists. So we <laughs> decided to take the jack out or whatever that thing is called, is it a jack or something? You take it out and you're supposed to put it under the car and lift the thing up. And as we were doing it, the thing slipped and the car fell down, you know. So after that, Salam never asked us to do anything with his car, <laughs> never asked for help. <laughs> it is true, uh, I think Tasneem was saying about his about him being so well read, actually. He was, at his, his, um, his thing in, his office in Impeel was covered in books of all kinds, actually. He was always reading. And in fact, in 1990 and 1991, he came from Trieste to Philadelphia. I picked him up from the airport, and the idea was to take him to Johns Hopkins for evaluation and things like that. He came with his wife, and so we had dinner at our place, and then we and while we were getting ready for dinner, Monica was preparing some things in the kitchen. He was browsing through her library. She has an extensive library at home. He picked up a book by Liv Ullman, you know, the Swedish actress. She has written an autobiography, so it was, must have been 91 or so. Started reading it. He kept reading it during dinner. He kept reading it in the car when I drove him to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And, you know, they were going to evaluate him, sleep disorders and other things and so on. He never let go of that book, actually. So next day, then, I picked him up from after the evaluation. I sat with him in the doctor's office. We got the evaluation. We left the place. And then he said, now I want to have a, a, some, a good American food, burger or something. So we went to Burger King. And he had, you know, burgers and French fries and so on. Then wanted to go to a bookstore. Now remember, he's not so well, he's still, I need to support him a little bit. But we took, I took him to a store, a bookstore, and he started picking all kinds of books there, including undergraduate text in physics. And so I said, what are you going to do with this? He said, no, no, it's good to have these books around. You know, you can always learn something. <laughs> and then, of course, he brought also two books with him. Some of you may know those super gravities in diverse dimensions, right? And there's big. I guess, too. They are still in my house because he brought it there and he said, they are for you. I said, you carry these heavy things? He said, yes, I had to bring something for you. you know, so. Anyway, so since we have heard so much about Salam today, I thought I'll, I'll say a few words about his contributions to physics beyond the standard model. We know about the electroweak theory and all that he did there, but of course, there is this thing called physics beyond the standard model. And, uh, Many of us think that there is some physics outside the standard model. And the question is what it is. And for the last 30 plus years, or 40 years even, people have been trying to figure out. And of course, Salam was one of the leaders. Together with Party and Salam, they created some of the first, the first actually, theories of unifying uh, strong and electroweak interactions, right? His standard model contribution is the electroweak force, and then there's this other contribution where you uh, try to unify all the forces. And there are motivations for doing that. And there are, and since I've been doing some work on these things, so I thought I'll try to give a flavor of how his contributions are still relevant. In fact, the, or as far as the physics beyond the standard model is concerned. So how does this work? Excuse me. Uh, uh, my talk is here somewhere. 
Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to say, so I'm, I apologize to people who are not physicists here. I hope it won't become too technical, but you're welcome to leave at any time you feel. Uh, <laughs> and the others too, if they wish. But anyway, so this is uh, going to be, uh, say something about Salam and physics beyond the standard model. Uh, this one is, so this is a picture I like about Salam, actually. This is, according to Anne, this is from 1964. So the Center must have been Piazza Oberdan. I wasn't there at that time, but I think this is a very nice. This is how I met Salam first, actually, uh, because I used to see him as an undergraduate in the physics department. Going, of course, he never he never gave us a, a course or anything, but I, I remember him like that. And um, this is in '93, and this is a very typical handshake from Salam, as you know. This is I'm sure, this is '93. Uh, we had a small ceremony in Trieste, and this is uh, Salam. Uh, in 1993. I actually saw him also in 1996. In August, I went to see him in Oxford and spent um, uh, about half an hour, 45 minutes with him. As you know, he passed away just about two months later, in fact. Um, let's see. So. This is one contribution of Salam that we haven't heard about. It's called BC Spin. Jogesh Party, Salam, and I, and also Yulu is here, who was involved in the beginning. This, this, this is an acronym for uh, Bangladesh, China, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, Nepal. And in fact, in 1989, was the first school held in Nepal. And Sir Abdul Salam came there, I actually took part in this uh, first school. The king of Nepal was there, the king Birindra. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the pictures. We have some pictures uh, with the king. And um, then this school existed for about, uh, till 1997. And then it kind of went away for a while, for several years. Salam passed away, unfortunately, in 1996. And then it was revived when with the help of Chinese colleagues of ours, actually. So this, um, I approached some people in China, and this, we added the V for Vietnam. And then later on, at the instigation of the National Science Foundation in the US, we started calling it also the Asian American Advanced Study Institute. So the funding largely came from, in the old days, not anymore, came from ICTP, National Science Foundation, China, started when BC Vispin, came along, and then actually in 2014, in December, because we now call it the Asian American Advanced Study, it was held in Mexico, in a place called Manzanillo, a beautiful place, in fact, in Mexico. And it's supported, in fact, by uh, now, by actually, when it's in China, largely by Chinese, but also by the Mitchell Foundation in Texas A&M, and then the University of Delaware also chips in a certain amount, because we tell them that this is a good thing to do, actually. So it's uh, nice of the university, actually, to agree with that. Now, this is an example of the acknowledgments we got from the BC Spin School. This is a 1994 school. I'm sure many of you can read some of these lang languages. There are all kinds of languages here. So it was, it said BC Spin, but there were people typically present from other countries, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and Russia and Europeans also came to these meetings. And a lot of eminent speakers, in fact, several Nobel Prize winners also presented talks at these meetings. This, was the, this is from the 1994 school. This is an example when it was revived, and partly actually from support from T.D. Lee. There's T.D. Lee here somewhere. This one is T.D. Lee. This is from the 2007 school. And T.D. Lee was really gracious enough to give us funding for housing for participants and so on. So, food, ex local expenses, and so on. And this is uh, Chung Feng Chao. He is involved in this thing we heard from Yulu this morning, that there's a new ICTP-like center being started in China. And he's involved also in that. A very kind, generous person, very, very helpful indeed. 
So in the old days, actually, when we started the schools, it was not easy to get Chinese participants to come to Nepal. They had to go via Hong Kong. And I remember in 1994, we lost one participant. You know, there were five or six Chinese coming, and we couldn't find one person. And there was no internet. You couldn't, there were no mobile phones and so on. It was quite hard, actually. It took us a week or so to find out that he must have gotten sick in Hong Kong and went back to China, but never told us, and we were really worried about it. So anyway, everything ended well. You see, BC Vispin, there were schools in Nepal and so on, where a lot of women also took part. I heard some women from China. But this is, again, inspired by Salam's example that we should really try to do, uh, you know, do our best to give back something. So anyway, now some remarks about physics, some physics in fact, uh, some physics beyond the standard model. Now there are experimental reasons to say that there is physics outside the standard model. And here are some examples. Neutrino physics. In the standard model, neutrinos are ma essentially massless. I mean they have a mass, uh, zero mass to all orders in perturbation theory. You can write down some higher dimensional operator. Uh, for the neutrino, gauge invariant, but the mass is then only about 10 to the minus 5 electron volt. If you assume that there's a standard model in gravity, then you cannot explain neutrino physics, neutrino oscillations. So you need some new physics. Dark matter, the standard model has no plausible dark matter candidate, assuming that gravity is unchanged and then we need some kind of an elementary particle or something. Origin of matter in the universe. Galaxies, you and I, we all made out of matter. What happened to the matter? The standard model cannot explain that. Uh, similarly, uh, electric charge quantization. It is an observed fact that all charges are quantized in units of 1 over 3, the D quark, if you like. And this is not explained in the standard model. In principle, I could add any charge I like in the standard model, say a particle with charge plus or minus pi. Nothing wrong with it in principle. But we don't see those things. Similarly, the microwave background for the hot Big Bang is highly isotropic to really isotropic with a temperature of about 2.725 Kelvin. But there are some anisotropies. And those anisotropies cannot be understood within the hot Big Bang cosmology, which comes from taking the standard model and combining it with general relativity. It, it's not explained. So we need some new things. And of course, one can continue that list, but these are kind of observed things that we want to explain. So, so Salam, of course, had made several contributions, in fact, to physics beyond the standard model. Uh, one of them, the, in the early 70s, 1972, I believe, is quark lepton unification, lepton number as fourth color, electric charge quantization, neutrino mass, even though it wasn't recognized in that paper, it took several years for people to re recognize the seesaw mechanism. It's already predicted, actually, in this picture. Baryon number violation. The paper is baryon number conserved. Superfields, we heard this morning and also in the afternoon. Superfields, the idea which made calculations possible, physics possible, and also R symmetry. And then kaluza klein theory, of course, and things like that. So I'll say a few words more about, just explain a little bit, and the current applications of some of these ideas, actually. So here is what we mean by quark lepton unification, or more generally, grand unification, where, the, where you have a gauge group instead of color. This is the so SU4 color rather than three color, and then left-right symmetry. So the elegance here is that parity violation that we observe that's just put in by hand comes out as a spontaneously violated symmetry in this kind of picture. There's a, otherwise, the theory is left-right symmetric if the if left-right symmetry is not spontaneously broken. And this is the lepton number as a fourth color. So SU4 acts this way, and SU2 left and right act in this direction. And of course, in this theory, neutrinos necessarily have a mass. And you have 15 fields of the standard model, 15, uh, 15 plus one more field, the right-handed neutrino, actually. So there are 16 fields in the theory. And in the SU5 model, the fields are just 15. It's the minimum unification, but neutrinos are still massless, so we need to extend this theory. Yeah, there's also a paper by Fritz and Miskowski after this uh, idea of SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2, and also Georgia, that this can be embedded inside this SO10. The number of degrees of freedom particles doesn't change. It remains 16, but uh, the gauge couplings are now unified, essentially. 
So, so one application. I take supersymmetry because I think I take the model of let's say of uh, the, the 422 model and supersymmetrize it and and with this relation coming from the group theory of the model. So this is just an example of how one can apply it. We tested it at LHC. This is an LHC application for collider physics. How do I distinguish this model, say, from a CMSSM theory that, that LHC physicists are always analyzing, right? That's one considered a simple model. Here, you, the, you, the SU4, this theory allows a gauge genome mass, and this one can uh, allow you a separate gauge genome mass. So you have these two masses, but then the U1 is embedded inside. Remember, charge is one times. And so it's related to these two guys. So this is a little different, right? So you can look for these relations. And to keep things brief, skip all that, I just wanted to say just a word about these are the fundamental parameters. Remember, as we heard today, no one knows really how supersymmetry is broken, even though it is broken, you know that. But we don't know how, so you can try different mechanisms. Here, these are just parameters. And so if you come, this is like CMSSM that the CMS and ATLAS present you with. These are uh, model space parameters. And this is an example of, of this model, uh, you know, the Pati Salam kind of model, for instance, where you see that you can get the right dark matter density and the, and the Gagino and the Gluino, for instance, masses are in the, around 3 TeV or something. And, and the neutralino, for instance, is a hexeno-like object, so you can look for it in direct detection experiments and so on. There's no time to go into that. So here, the, the Higgs mass, for instance, is fixed, right? If, you're, if I didn't know this value, then you, know, you could have a different parameter space. So you have to fix all the physics, LHC, B physics, and so on, and then finally look for parameters. And this is one of the choices that's still available for us. So hopefully, in run three and so on, we'll see if anything is found. This is another example of a model, which is, again, sorry for the clutter here. Basically, there I impose another one, apart from gauge coupling unification, you can also impose, let's say, Yukawa unification of the third family, which is known for many years. And if you impose that as a condition, then even though I won't go into it, actually, Yukawa unification is much more stringent than gauge coupling unification because it explores the Feynman diagrams, finite loop diagrams, and tells you a great deal about the spectrum. And these red colors give you the, the neutralino, the LSP neutralino. And it tells you that in some of these models, the gluino is not so heavy, but it's NLSP next to lightness. So, and, but after run two, the, these constraints from NLSP perhaps are like several hundred GB. So in fact, these models that were written down in the 70s, supersymmetrized later, and now you can use these models to test at the LHC. So this is, this is the nice feature about these models. You can actually test it in dark matter experiments and so on. This is part of his contributions really to physics beyond the standard model. Now, this is, there's a subheading, those guys from Harvard. This is a sanitized version of what he actually said. In 1985, I was in Trieste explaining to Salam, what we had been doing uh, with Vetherish, and I had written a paper about what's called, what people were becoming, you know, extra dimensions were coming in, and we said, okay, if we have a compactified theory, grand unified theory, then maybe these extra dimensions we can test. And so, so we said, so Vetherish and I said, well, okay, take a grand unified theory like SU5, you can actually write down some higher dimensional operators, it's written here somewhere, I don't know, somewhere here, let's say, F mu nu, F mu nu, the gauge invariant term, non abelian with a field five which gets a gut wave. And so if this field has a gut scale and compactification is an order or two magnitude larger, then this can modify the boundary conditions. So as I was explaining to John on the blackboard, Salam walked in and he said, what are you doing? So I tried to tell him that we were trying to see how the gut predictions can be modified if these guts came from a compactified theory, right? There could be corrections, which can mean that you can increase the proton lifetime slightly or change the value of the weak mixing angle, sine squared theta w. And at that point, he made a remark, and this is why, basically he was trying to say, why are you trying to save those guys from Harvard? Basically, this was the George I. Gleshaw paper, so I still remember that. Uh, I, although I told him that we actually, the next example on the next page was an SU4 example. 
And so 10 example with, you know, why is that not moving forward? Anyone here? Some expert? Ah, this, this way? Ah, yeah, so this is just part of that one. This is an example of SOTEN. So now the biggest hoax in physics. So in the, in the 80s, in the early 80s, Jogesh and I, and, um, and um, some others joined us later, uh, started these summer schools in Trieste called elementary particle physics, particle physics and cosmology. I'm not sure if they still go on. So they went on for several weeks, actually. And we had cosmology pretty early on. And I used to discuss with Salam some cosmology, in fact. In, indeed, I used to tell him a little bit about you know, uh, inflation, because Vilenkin and I wrote an early paper in 1983. Salam didn't work on cosmology at that time. Then Vetterish and I wrote a paper on high dimensional cosmology in 83. I explained to him. And he never really trusted that so much. So he said to me one day in the late 80s, I think, after even though we had these schools and Mike Turner, Rocky Cole, all these people came and gave lectures, he never really trusted inflation that much. In fact, he said that one of his eminent colleagues, I'm not going to try to name who this colleague is, but his eminent, has said that is inflation the greatest hoax in physics? That's the subheading here. Now, the reason we like inflation, some of us at least, is because it solves many problems in Big Bang cosmology. Remember, standard model plus gravity, Einstein's gravity, gives you hot Big Bang. That doesn't explain CMB isotropy, doesn't explain why delta T over T is found, and isotropy is found, why there is an observed baryon asymmetry, no dark matter, and so on. So we need some new physics, and in fact, you can't even do inflation. If you just didn't do anything more to, if you don't think of with gravity and took the standard model, you can't do gravity, you can't do inflation. So inflation basically came along and try in the 80s, and then we and it required some physics beyond the standard model, and actually resolves several issues, several problems. So it took, in fact, the COBE experiment, the satellite experiment in 1992. COBE was launched in 89, I believe. And in 1992, they pre presented this dramatic result that there are these anisotropies. Delta T over T is on the order of 10 to the minus 5. That was an important discovery, and they got the Nobel Prize for it a few years later. The important thing is, by having delta T over T, which means the quantum fluctuations of the field that drives inflation also generates this delta rho over rho fluctuations, and therefore can explain where the quantum fluctuations come from, which give rise to large-scale structure. So you can see quantum mechanics basically playing a crucial role in the origin of structure in the universe, essentially. That's the best explanation we have. There's no place today to talk about inflation basically mean an accelerating universe. Now, 30 years ago, you might have thought this is strange. But today, we know the universe is also accelerating. So it's again in an inflationary phase except that the energy scale is much lower. But the universe is accelerating, and that also got a Nobel Prize some years ago. So, so 1992, this to be contrasted, actually, with Gell-Mann. In the early 80s, Murray Gell-Mann was spending a sabbatical at CERN. And I was also there in Lazaridis, and we, were, we had just we started to learn inflation. And Murray used to come to my office afterwards because he was traveling all over the place, of course, giving talks to find out what happened in the previous week at CERN. So when he came, I, I actually explained to him what inflation was, the way I understood it at that time. And Murray thought about it. And I still remember he said to me, inflation has to be right, he said. He said, I thought of inflation when I was 11. So. <laughs> Um, he really said that. Of course, there was a period when people thought that he was the brightest, smartest guy uh, in the universe. So this is uh, an explanation of how inflation is, uh, solves it. But inflation basically means a slow rolling field that rolls down. You might think, is it the field, the Weinberg Salam Hicks field that rolls down? But as I said, that doesn't quite work. Because in the early universe, it could have rolled down and sit it. Because when Weinberg Salam did it, they were they seated the Higgs field with this breaking tray, right? It's like a superconductor, essentially. Higgs mechanism is a partial superconductor, if you like. The photon doesn't see the condensate, but otherwise, the W and Z are in a superconducting phase, of course. In any case, 
there's a slow roll of inflation, there's the field rolls, according to Einstein's equations, the universe has to explain, expand exponentially, and that's what inflation is. And one of the most important things that we can measure now, the experimentalists can measure, is this object called R, the tensor to scalar ratio. It measures the amount, it basically discovery of these gravity waves generated during inflation is quantified in terms of this ratio R, and we know that R is less than 0 0.1 from Kobe. Two years ago or so, a year and a half, about two years ago, remember BICEP2 explained that they have discovered R, that has turned out to be incorrect. But we know that there's an upper bound of R for, of 0 0.1. Notice that if R is about 0 0.1 or so, or even a bit smaller, the energy density during inflation is on the order of 10 to the 16 GeV. That's the gut scale, the grand unified theory scale. So in other words, discovery of R would mean that the, that the energy density at one point was about 10 to the 16 GeV. That's dramatic. That the most important discovery we can make in cosmology, I suppose, now. And so people are doing several experiments. Pardon, 10 minutes? So, OK. So now Salam also did this super field stuff and R symmetry. Here is an example of what I think is using this R symmetry in super field language, probably the simplest model of inflation you can write down. It has super symmetry, but therefore that's why it has R symmetry. So the idea is, instead of a potential, like a Lagrangian we heard, L equals T minus V, we write down a super potential. And from the super potential, in terms of super fields of Salam and Strat B, we write down this thing. And from there, we can, and this has an R symmetry also. In other words, the W is not an invariant, but it's invariant up to some phase, because we have to integrate W finally. And so it's, and it's a unique renormalizable super potential. Now, why is that interesting? Well, if you from this W, you can construct the potential, right? Remember, for inflation, we have a potential, and the field rolls down to its minimum. And we want to construct the flat potential. But look at what this potential is from this, just this R symmetry. It is, this, this is it. Kappa squared minus n squared of this plus this. So in other words, the supersymmetric minimum is V0. The potential energy is zero, then essentially Susie is unbroken. And this is this. So this is phi is m, and s is zero. S is a field that I had to put in because it's supersymmetric field. But what is this thing? This is nothing else than a landau Ginsburg superconductor. In other words, in this approximation, Cooper pairs are there today. The field is in a superconducting phase, and the s is zero, or the temperature is zero. So how do we do inflation? Well, you have to have potential energy and therefore supersymmetry is broken, and therefore S must be moved away from zero. So S is this field which drives inflation. In the early universe, it sits somewhere there, then runs down, and as it runs down, you basically do inflation. Nothing is simpler than that, and basically you can compute a lot of quantities, and this is a pretty good model. It predicts that R should be bounded from above by 0.02 or so. Anyway, let me go back now to one more thing since time has run out, more or less. Electric charge quantization. In their 72, 73 papers, we had these 224 models which, which, in which electric charge is quantized. Now, what's the consequence of that? Well, we already know for many years that if you have an electric charge quantization in the theory, Dirac said, I can ex explain quantization if you give me monopoles. These theories say we have electric charge quantization. But then it turns out that there are monopoles in here, automatically. We don't have to put them in by hand. The monopoles are like topologically stable soliton solutions, also <coughs> called tof polykov polyakov monopoles, right? And their mass is related to the symmetry breaking scale. So if, if you like, if SU5 is a theory, then the symmetry breaking scale has to be high because they, they have, there's proton decay in these models, so the monopoles are heavy. So the only way to make these guys is in the early universe. And there you have to confront inflation and things like that. And if you have, of course, other groups like this one, then you have also monopoles. So I want to give you one example of whether monopoles and inflation can coexist. And this is this example of a grand unified theory broken to 224 or 422 and then broken to the standard model. There are two sets of monopoles. When this breaks to this model group, there are monopoles actually. It is a Dirac monopole, it turns out. And when this one breaks 
to the standard model, we know that this is the present symmetry breaking, uh, the low energy theory. Then there are two sets of monopoles. And now, if you know the Hubble constant during inflation, and you can compare it with the symmetry breaking scales here, and see whether the monopoles survive inflation or not. That's the way to study it. So, in fact, this is a Higgs model. Suppose the inflaton potential is like a Higgs potential, like this. From experiments, we already know that the field should come down here for inflation to happen. Already, this part is excluded. This is the minimum. And so, if you do all this calculation, you, you for instance, well, there's no time to go into that stuff. You can actually, depending on the Hubble constant during inflation, you can have an observable number density of monopoles. So this is this requires a large-scale experiment, of course, and to get, in other words, intermediate mass monopoles with with their masses closely correlated with the Hubble constant during inflation. You can then discuss whether monopoles can exist or not. And remember, the Hubble constant is determined by the gravity wave. So all this is a nice picture, and all this, the, at least the Hubble constant will be determined if the gravity waves are found. So. And that would be quite dramatic, right? I and mean, the energy, we know that the, the Fernand Weinberg model is broken at 100 GeV, but this would take us to 10 to the 16 GeV, orders of magnitude higher. Proton decay is another prediction. Now, so let me try to, since time is really running out, let me just mention this. Tomorrow we'll hear about this. This is one of the most exciting things that has happened, right, recently from round two. And the excitement is because there's a lot of pent up energy. There are a lot of people. Ages from 90 to let's say 25, who have been working on physics beyond the standard model. If they see something different, they want to jump on it. And already there's a lot of excitement about these events, right? So many of you have seen it. This is taken from a blog by Haslava. Somebody, my student picked it from somewhere, I'm not sure. Pardon? No, this is not Strumia, this is some other chair from the blog. This is not from a paper, but a blog. In any case, apparently, you see that the excitement is that the, the signal is not, doesn't look that big, but it seems to be around 700 GeV. So minimal supersymmetric models and so on won't be able to explain that, actually. You need something a little bit different. And I was thinking, you know, if Abdus would be around today, he would have written one of the first papers on the subject. <laughs> Imperial College would be at the forefront because in his heyday, certainly he would have written more than one with different explanation. Because this calls for action immediately. So you see, the day this was announced, already before the announcement, there were a dozen people ready. I know at least one person who was there with his paper, 25 pages, <laughs> explaining where this little bump. Remember, the, the reason is this looks like the Higgs signal, right? So remember, this is the Higgs pose. This is how the Higgs, we think, happens, right? The, gluon, the gluons fuse together through the top quark. You make a Higgs, and then it decays into gamma gamma. So this, of course, doesn't explain the 750 G event. And so you have to put some new physics in. And that's the challenge, essentially. Of course, it could happen that in run, during run three, and after run three, this will all go away. But for the moment, it's certainly one of the most exciting things in <coughs> physics. And I'm sure Salah would have been right there pushing his people to sort of get things done. And uh, let me see if I have any concluding remarks, basically. I mean, there were many anecdotes, actually, I wrote down, but there's not enough, not enough time to talk about it. There was one day we were having coffee in the physics department. We were in coffee break at 10.30 or something. And Salam and I and Paul Matthews and others were in a line waiting for our coffee and cookie. And at some point, I don't know what happened, and uh, Matthew said to Salam, what is the meaning of Khan? Because, you know, Khan was a Yub Khan, the president, field marshal, and so on. And Salam said, it mean, I think it's got, uh, it means leader. So he said to him, then why aren't you called Salam Khan? Why are you not Salam? Ah, yeah, OK. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he once, I think, just me mentioned, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, Salam Sun also mentioned how he was treated by the government. In Trieste, he was more free. You could talk more freely with him. And one day, he came a bit frustrated, essentially, a little bit annoyed with the government. He had come back, and they had not done things that they had agreed with him. And I said to him, half-jokingly, I said, 
just give up. Why don't you forget about these guys? Why do you worry about it? He said, no, never. You never give up. And that was the way, really, he led his life. You never give up. You face up to challenges, and you keep trying. I remember as a student, he also, in order to motivate some of his students, he once said to, said to us, you know what? The only time I worked hard in my life was when I was a graduate student. So I went back to that in Trieste many years later, and I said, you once told me that, you know, that you never work hard, but you were always here in Trieste, and you're working. And remember, the remarkable thing about Salam was that despite all his work, super fields, guts, and you name it, he was, he always had time to talk to people. Always could find time. People would wait outside his office, you know, during lunch hour, and he would see people from all over the world, no matter unknown, known, young, well-known, he would find time and then talk with them and with patience, listen to them, write letters for them, get them promoted. How many people do I know who got their jobs because the letters were written by Salam? Sometimes I had to help him even, try to compose the letter. But anyway, it had to be signed by him to get the job. So I think this would be okay to stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this nice talk. Uh, there's uh, time for a few questions. There's one over there, Jagesh. Uh, Kaiser, since you mentioned about BC Spin uh, and Salam, uh, I thought I will just add a few comments in that regard. Sure. See, Salam's uh, unique uh, view was it started like this. Uh, one evening in Maryland, I was taking dinner, and then Salam calls me up from Trieste. He says, Yogesh, what do you think of the following idea? I said, what? He said, uh, you know, people come to Trieste from these developing countries. How about having some part of Asia, Asian countries, the physicists just get together there in some uh, country which will be closer to their own country, but uh, in a way they will develop better understanding not of not just of physics but of each other, yeah. because the basic motivation he had was that uh, you know there are political conflicts between different countries, right. so he said that uh, this way they will understand each other through physics. I said that sounds like an excellent idea. So he said, uh, then he asked me, OK, but what do you think it should be? I said, well, it has to be at, at a more or less a politically neutral country. And right. I think both of us thought right away that Nepal is also being, <laughs> having Mount Everest and so on, would be attractive for all the lecturers. So that's how uh, Nepal was chosen. But then he said, all right, uh, uh, will you be? willing to take charge of it right away. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I said, I was not prepared for that. But mm -hmm. I said, uh, I think that sounds like a good idea. So I certainly will look into it. So then it's, it started that way. And the countries, as you know, were chosen. Uh, Bangladesh, China, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, and Nepal. And the good thing of that was, then you have carried on with uh, a few other countries that uh, really the people from Pakistan and India were collaborating with yeah. each other, discussing right. with each other, China and India yeah. and mm -hmm. Bangladesh. And so they, that, that, that really had a great value for physics and for a mutual understanding. Yeah. And certainly Salam's initiative in it, he, he took the initiative. Uh, uh, to, to suggest this idea, yeah. and uh, it was successful, I have to say. Unfortunately, things uh, in Nepal became rather troublesome later on, right. but uh, mm. they, those schools were very successful in attracting some of the best lecturers and uh, also participants. Yeah. Thank you. It's time for one more comment or question. Uh, Mike? Just a technical point. You said the standard model does not explain charge quantization. Right. 
But if you couple it to gravity, then the cancellation of the mixed gauge gravity anomalies does require charge quantization. Oh, even without gravity. Yeah. But the anomalies require you know, balancing of the charges. But my point is that if I take your standard model and add to it something with hypercharge plus or minus, left and right symmetric vector-like object, it will still be, it still be consistent. There's no inconsistency in violating charge quantization, even with gravity. Because if you have charge quantization, you have to have monopoles. So, I guess and you want to and gut theories that. give you monopoles automatically. Otherwise, if you just take SU2 cross U1, that charge is not quantized, strictly speaking. Yeah, I didn't hear you very well. But no, yeah. we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Jogesh wants to make uh, a comment. Well, since Kaiser mentioned you can cancel it by anomalies, I should like to comment. You see, anomalies can be canceled by many different ways. Yeah. So it does not lead to any unique pattern. So that, that should not be regarded as a real explanation of charge quantization. That's right. I, I, that's why I said the, that Dirac is finally right, right? He said you need monopoles for charge quantization. These theories have charge quantization, really, and therefore there are monopoles. Now, in Kaluz some Kaluza-Klein theory, you can get on compactification on an S1 or something, Kaluza-Klein monopoles, and there can be charge quantization. That's, that's also possible. But monopoles have to be there somehow. Okay, uh, with that, let's uh, thank Edward again and close the session.